all this time. Uh, you'll be hearing yesterday, 62-year-old said that he wants to inspire you. This time, it's a 72-year-old uh, lady who wants to share her life with you and also um, the lifelong uh, commitment which has driven uh, much of her work. Let me tell you a bit about myself because I hope some of you will identify uh, your lives with that of my own. I know it's incredible. You cannot imagine yourself as 72 years old because easily I'm more than 50 years older than most of you. And a good number of you are still in high school. How many of you are from high school? High school pa. Marami uh, pang high school and you still have your entire life ahead of you and you cannot imagine. When I was in high school, I could not imagine myself. Uh, such a far off thing to be, to be a grandmother or to be uh, 72 years old or to be 75 years old. Now, um, I come from Nags Oriental. I was born in Bihulman, one of the towns. So I'm really a genuine from the uh, I grew up in this town and uh, I grew up in Negros Oriental where status and privilege is measured by the amount of property that you have. This is really what happens in most societies and that is what uh, Mr. Maloka shared with you yesterday and also uh, by it. You grew up not really very, very, very poor, but you are not also even middle class. My parents were school teachers, and we didn't even own a single flower pot of land. They were just school teachers. And since there was no RH during that time, for family planning, uh, there were eight of us. Uh, children, five uh, five boys and uh, three three girls in the family. School teachers, not a single piece of property. My father graduated from Silman University. At that time, it was an institute, and it was amb his ambition to send all of us to to Silman. There was never any question about it. All of us were going to Silman, and there were eight of us. And I was born in October 16, 1940 three months before the outbreak of the uh, Second World War, the Japanese came. We have had three waves of imperialists, if you remember, conquering the Philippines. Yesterday, Xiao taught, told you about how the Spaniards came and then the Americans came. And I was born just a few months before the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and eventually also bombed the Philippines. Again, that is something which you read only in history books, but which my family underwent. So I was just a, a child, and my father, again, many of us, the dream of becoming activists, become, of becoming leaders, of leading the country, and perhaps even dying for the country. When we were in college, it was our dream to die for the country, because all heroes, all heroes die for the country. And so we look forward to that, of fighting for the country. But to live it and to really fight for the country, that's a different matter altogether. It's different from just reading and dreaming and watching uh, movies. So my father joined the guerrillas fighting against the Japanese. And of course you read about all the stories about, about the Filipinos who starved the death march in the past and the guerrillas have to fought. You see it in the movies. Few small band of people stealing goods, stealing arms, fighting against the conqueror, and you always feel good about it. But at the time, you didn't even have time to feel good because you're sick, there's no food, and so on. At the same time, I was still a baby during that time. And so I grew up in the mountains. I spent my babyhood in the mountains because my family had to go to the mountains to hide from the Japanese because my father was one of the many Filipinos who fought against the Japanese. And my mother was a school teacher. And since a school teacher is always a school teacher. So there we were in the mountains hiding. And I remember, I don't know, how far back does your memory go? 
what are the earliest things that you remember about your babyhood, about your childhood? What I remember is that we're living in this in this house, in this nipahat, and then my aunties and my mothers would be taking, you know, uh, the thread out of um, the stockings of socks, and then taking the thread out so that they would have something to sew and to darn and to mend clothes, because there was no thread and there's no food, and so if your clothes are torn, it's not as if like now, you will die if you don't have a dress for Founders Day, if you don't have a new pair of shoes because you want to attend the NYDS, or you want to buy a Silliman t-shirt or a LaSalle shirt, and so on, and you will die if you don't have it. But during those times, you don't even have thread to be able to, to darn your torn clothes. And so that's one of my earliest memories of picking thread from the socks of my father so that they would have friends to dark clothes with. And since my mother was a teacher, she could not stand all the mountain kids who were there and uh, who did not know how to read and to write. I was three years old. I remember, I don't know how far back you can remember. I'm 72, but I remember the time when I was two years old and I would be picked up by my eldest cousin and you would hear the drone of the airplanes you know, flying very low the Japanese airplanes and bombing, you know, the hills of Negros. And I remember running out of, I mean, not being able to breathe because I was held so closely by my elder cousin and running and hiding under the trees and against the rocks. Anyway, by the time I was three, my mother felt that it was time for us we somehow thought that we were going to spend all our lives in the mountains. And the Japanese would be there all our lives. Because they were running the country and you hear all these horrible stories about the girls being raped and so on. Men being brought into forced labor, tortured, executed. I would hear stories at night about the guerrillas being tortured. Or cousins, or the beautiful girls of the town being carried off and brought out to houses of prostitution for the Japanese soldiers. So anyway, so my mother thought that it was time for us to read and to write. How did you learn how to read and to write? How did you learn how to read? Well, you, you watched Sesame Street, I am I'm sure. You watched all the skitty shows and you had all these books. You had all these building blocks. You had all these books. But in the mountains, we didn't even have food. And here was a mother who wanted to teach her children and the other children how to read and to write. But there were banana leaves. You know how the banana leaves look like? Banana leaves have lines. So what my mother did was to gather the children into our hut and she would cut banana leaves which had lines and then she would sharpen the sticks of the bamboos, bamboo sticks. So parang barbecue sticks, and then we would write with the sharpened bamboo sticks on banana leaves. And so that is how I learned how to write the ABC. Not with Sesame Street, not with television, not with nursery school, not with radio and so on, not with chalk, but with banana leaves and sharpened bamboo sticks. Many of you grew up eating rice. And I don't think you can imagine a time when you will not be able to eat rice. When I was much older, I thought if I cannot eat rice, I think I will die. But there was a time in my childhood when we were not eating rice. We were eating kamoting kahoy, we were eating corn. I grew up until high school not eating rice. So how did a child who learned how to write with sharpened bamboo sticks on banana leaves, who learned, who grew up not nourished by rice or cake or butter or, or bread, 
but by corn, grits, and kamote. When I was a child, I had goiters because if you live in the mountain, you don't have access to iodine. Iodine is a very important component of childhood, of, of growing up, and for children. But you get iodine from fish, you get iodine from seafood, and we're in the mountains hiding from the Japanese. And so my parents fed me kamote leaves. Because kamote leaves are very high in iodine. Did you know that? And now, you can even drink kamote leaves juice. And it's very delicious to drink it with calamansi. But anyway, how did a child who grew up writing on banana leaves, eating corn grits, drinking coconut, uh, drinking kamote juice leaves, eating malunggay, and wearing, you know, uh, clothes made from sacks of flour, flour, and after the war, immediately after the war, clothes made from the parachutes of the American planes, because these are made from silk, no? And, and those were the clothes that we wore. How did she grow up to become, to graduate at the age of 17, Magna Cum Laude, major in accounting, from Silliman University, finished graduate studies at the University of the Philippines, graduated with distinction from one of the best universities in England and went to Harvard, became treasurer of the Philippines, and now, and that is what it is all about. The best way to start life is to start with nothing at all. To start with nothing but what Mr. Belotto said, to start with a dream. And when I was a child, I grew up, there was never any question about it. I would go to Silliman University. UP was so far, it was incredible in our town at that time. There was only one person who was able to go to UP. Because to go to UP, you have to be very wealthy. To be from the Visayas or to be from Mindanao, to study in UP or in Ateneo or in La Salle, you have to have land, you have to have property, to pay for the fares, to pay for the tuition, the clothes, and to give you pride and place among the elite and the wealthy. See, it was Silliman as far as we were concerned. And we start with nothing. That is how NYDS also started. NYDS started with nothing. NYDS started with just a dream. There we were, sitting. I'm convener of Social Watch Philippines. And Social Watch Philippines dared challenge the budget. Social Rights Philippines dared present an alternative budget. Social Rights Philippines for the 2013 budget dared to say, you have to return to the different agencies of government. 22 billion, go bring it back to health, to education, to health, and to agriculture. Thanks, you know, you know, uh, I was watching you and I was so, I was so amused, I was watching you. The, the littlest things make you happy. Somebody dances, somebody says something funny. And, and, and you're very happy and it makes your day. Somebody is nice looking and makes your day. But you change the country. <laughs> you challenge a two trillion budget. And you give an alternative budget and you change it. And of course, it makes all of us happy. And that is what we are challenging you. Yesterday, you are challenged to change the face of poverty. Another young woman, well, all of you are young in so far as I am concerned. Even the 50-year-olds are young to me. The 40-year-olds are young to me. So my E is very young to me. And my E challenged you to take possession of your lives, of your bodies, of 
your plans and um, the size of your families. And also a young man named Xiao challenged you also to understand what you are, to go back, to understand why you behave this way, why you are get crazy about Gangnam, <laughs> why you are crazy about bikini beauty contests, and, and, and so on. Why is it that when you have programs since yesterday, since last night, and since this morning, I still have to hear somebody sing a Filipino song? And she said, after, the third, after the lecture of Shao, I thought somebody would sing something in Filipino, or something in Mugindanao, or something in Tausuk, or something in Elongo. But, but I think we have to bring the process of remembering. And that is how you all start with. And so, why is a 70-year-old speaking to you? Because a 70-year-old will help you to remember and to understand what you are and what you can look forward to. And if the 60-year-olds can tell you what they do, a 30-year-old tells you what she does, a 70 year old tells you what you do. You in your 20s can always say you can do anything and everything, the most impossible things you can do. Because when I was a child, I never dreamt I would go. Some of you from Rizal, already here in Dumaguete, already riding a plane. I had to be 20 years old to ride a plane to go to UP from Silliman. You Children, some of you already have even gone abroad already. So nothing is impossible. Everything is possible. And especially if you have the gift of youth, if you have the gift of strength. And so do not waste it. And so this morning, morning pa ba o na? Morning pa rin. I will share with you another challenge. The challenge of participating in government. The challenge of participating in what Josie identified as public finance. If you can meet a challenge in a beauty contest, a challenge in singing, a challenge in leadership, a challenge in, you know, overcoming poverty, you can meet the challenge of public finance, of making sure that government spends your money wisely. And this is a very long introduction because I had to get your attention, I had to look at your faces, I had to look at your eyes to be able to bring what is um, a very interesting topic. Who cares about finance? Finance is all about asking money from your parents, <laughs> Finance is all about asking money from your auntie and your cousins and asking for gifts from abroad and begging with tears in your eyes for uh, an increase in allowance or a new gadget. Okay, next. Um, so, why is there a need for people participation? I look to you not only as young people, but you are people. You are people, you are citizens. All of you are citizens. Those of you who are in high school, not yet fully citizens, but the minute you enter 18, you are already citizens. You already are part of this country, you are stockholders in this country. You own this country, you pay for this country. From the time that you were born, you have already been paying for this country. Because when you drink your milk, when you go to the movies, when you buy your books, when you buy your medicine, when you have your hair straightened, or you have your hair curled, or you have the color of your eyes changed, you are paying taxes. And as sure as night turns into day, and so on, those taxes eventually reach government or whatever is left of it. Okay. So why is there a need for people to participate in public finance? But what is public finance all about? I have to take time to sit down because I have a slip disc and I am continually in pain at night. Since I'm not busy anymore, then the pain takes over. But now I'm looking at you, I'm looking at your eyes. And I see that I really have to share, I have to reach out. 
anyway. So what is public finance? Public finance, you know, finance, a portion of finance is money. But what is the public part of it? Public finance is the inflow when money enters into government. When money from your tuition, the money from the drinks, the money from the books and the snacks that you pay, which always has a certain amount in terms of taxes, goes into government. And then that money is supposed to go out of government. So it's inflow, money goes into government. It's supposed to go out of government, but when it goes out, it's already in another form. It's not money anymore. It is services. So money is transformed by government, by your congressman, by your department of education, by your public works. It's transformed into schoolhouses, transformed into schools, into books, into medicine, into whatever information and so on. It goes back to the people. So it's inflow of money from the people and that is you. And it's outflow of money back to the people and that is you. And the instrumentality is government. That is public finance. The reason why you use the word public as distinguished from private is because it is all our money. It all comes from us. It all comes from you when you buy your pair of shoes, when you buy your blouse, or when you buy your no low neck dress, and so on and so forth, or your bikini. <laughs> so, so that is public finance. So what is citizen participation? You are citizens. When you turn 18, you're going to be citizens and you're going to vote. I hope I will not talk like my aunt said, when you turn 18, you'll be a mother or you'll be a father. And when you turn 18, you have three children. Okay. So what is citizen participation? Citizen participation is, I'm sure when you go back, you will have to be sharing what you've learned. It's defined, and my favorite definition of people's participation or citizens' participation is by Buendia. Boy Buendia is an official in the United Nations. I like him because he happens to be my student. He took his master's and his doctoral degree in, in, in UP. And so he came up with his own definition. What is participation? Participation is the expression of citizenship. Now all of you are citizens, but if you do not participate in government, like you do not vote at all, or like you do not ask questions at all, or you do not find out and monitor what your government is doing, you are not expressing your citizenship and you are not really citizens. Or in the definition of Noel Cabangon, you are not maboting Filipino. So that citizenship is expressed in participation. Whether you are 18 or you are 80, whether you are 28 or, or 38, it's the expression of citizenship. And it's not only the expression of citizenship, it is the exercise of power. Citizenship is power. Citizenship is not just watching television and getting bored with all the speeches. Ayan na naman si Congressman. Ayan na naman si Governor. Ayan na naman si Mayor. It is power to... It's the collective exercise of power of the organized and the disadvantaged basic sectors to advance people's interest for the greater public good. Now, each word here is very important. The greater public good, not just the greater my good. I did not need the president of the Philippines to study at Silliman or to go to the, or go to Harvard or to go to England. I did it with my help, with my own self and my friends and so on and my own hard work. But 
when you are a citizen, it is for the greater public good, which is pursued within and beyond the confines of the public arena. You don't have to be a public official. You don't have to be an SK. Do you know, SK start very young. To be elected, sometimes they have to kidnap their opponents. <laughs> to make preso preso. Or to buy off. And then they start young. And this is why everybody, everybody takes that's why everybody takes for granted the SOP. Because many SKs also have SOP. And that is also taken for granted. As sure as you drink water, you take SOP with every contract that you do. Many SKs are only 15 year old, 16 year olds. So they ask the barangay captain to sign the contracts for them. And then they get a sharing. And this is why, and so you have a big battle ahead of you. If you have a big battle, as Tony Miloto says, against poverty, or if you have a big battle for women's rights and to take care of your bodies, as Miley says, and Anna will say you have a battle, big battle for the environment, you also have a big battle for the resources. And you have also a big battle against the malpractices in governance. Why do we always talk about governance? We always say problems of governance. When you say governance, sometimes it's always synonymous with graft and corruption. The head assume na yan. But that is not what you were taught. That is not what your churches taught you. That is not what your schools taught you. That is not what your teachers taught you. And some of you have your teachers with you. Uh, because you are too young to be traveling around and going off to Silliman University and the Magetti City. And that is not what you are taught, but you have to live what you are taught. And you have to live, you have to live in the real world and not in the world of books, in the world of what the teacher tells you. So it has to be within and beyond the confines of the public arena. You don't have to be a public official. You only have to be a good citizen and you only have to express your citizenship. Okay, next. Next. So, so right now, um, that was when the Obrionas has broadened people's participation to include the NGOs, civil society organizations, professional groups, academic institutions, church and civic organizations, in addition to the basic sectors, because Buendia only talks about the basic sectors. And they form networks, they form advocacies, like NYDS is a network as citizens groups. Next. Now, some of us think that citizens' participation, public participation, is a new thing. Lahat nagsasabi, makikilahaw kayo. But actually, these practices go back to our earlier community practices. Only nakakalimutan na lang natin before the coming of what we call, during our time, what we call the foreigners. Hindi pa, wag pa maabot ang mga foreigners, hindi pa dumating ang mga foreigners. We had traditional communities. Decisions were made by communities. Decisions were made by consulting with the elders and also of young people participating in these decisions. But these were suppressed during the colonial period and marginalized by 18 years of martial law regime. And besides, we had so many conquerors and so many invaders. According to Hapon, I noticed that uh, Xiao was quoting uh, uh, Carmen Guerrero Nakpil and Carmen Guerrero Nakpil used to write and say that the reason why Filipino women are so difficult to understand. You ask any man, and I don't think any man can say that they understand women perfectly, especially the Filipino women. And so many Carmen Guerrero Nakpil, the reason why they are so difficult to understand is because 
They spent nearly 400 years in a convent, 50 years in Hollywood, and then about 10 years in a Japanese prison. And so now that they are supposedly free, all of these things are converging. No. So um, citizens' participation is provided for in the 1987 Constitution. Next. And so you have the Constitution which says, the state shall respect the role of independent people's organizations, and that includes youth organizations. So never be afraid to pursue and to protect within the democratic framework the legitimate and collective interests and aspirations. And people's organizations are defined by the Constitution as bona fide associations of citizens with demonstrated capacity to promote public interest with identified leadership. Hindi yung nagtago-tago na leadership. Uh, you will wonder, who is behind this? Who is manipulating who? Who is the shadow behind the shadow? Uh, so you have an organization and there is a shadow group operating. It's not like that. The Constitution says you have to have leadership and with demonstrated capacity to promote interest with identified leadership, membership, and structure. Next. So the right of the people and their organizations, the effective and reasonable participation at all levels of social, political, and economic decision making shall not be abridged. It shall never be abridged. It is a full right, protected by the Constitution, protected by the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. And the state shall not abridge such right. It shall facilitate this establishment of adequate consultation mechanisms, etc., etc. It should never be abridged. Next. So, going back to public finance, and I said because of public finance, money coming in, and money going out. But it's not money anymore. It has been converted to services. Who converts this money into services? It's the government. Supposedly, the value of what goes out should be bigger than what goes in. Because that is, that is what physics tells us. So what do you ask? When you talk about the budget, whether it is the SK budget, or your municipal budget, or your government, the provincial budget, or the national budget itself, you ask, where is the money coming from? Who bears the burden of maintaining government? Kinsa ang nakarga? Sino ang kumakargo? Ano ba yun? Sa Pilipino? who carries the burden of maintaining government, who pays for the salaries of our president, of our congressmen, of our senators, of our governors, of our school teachers, our doctors, who pays? All of us, yes. But out of the many sectors of government, who bears the bigger burden of bearing the expenses of government? See, no, who, who bears the bigger burden? Is it the poor, the middle class, or the very, the very, very rich? It's the poorest by the very simple reason that there are so many of them. Maybe an individual poor person cannot say that what he gives in taxes for his milk, for the bigas, for the pamasahi, will not be able to pay the salary of a policeman. But all of them put together contribute so much more than those of the other classes. This is because it just so happens there are so many more poor people and as a group they consume more. Because right now a great part of our taxes come from what is the fact? It's the value added taxes which are consumption taxes. Each time that you buy something, you consume something, you are paying taxes. The next question is equally important in public finance. Where is the money going to? Huh? 
Where does the money go to? Who are the recipients? Who are taking advantage? Who are the beneficiaries of government service? Of course, the students from UP are beneficiaries. <laughs> of you. The scholars are beneficiaries. How about the how about the, the IPs? The Bogobos in uh, in in uh, in, 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 Magpep, in Cotabato. Uh, the Muslims in Tulunan, etc. So who are the recipients and objects of what? Who gets the bigger share of government services? You have to find that out for yourselves. The third is if the money is coming from most of the Filipino people, and many of the Filipino people are poor, and if the money is going to those, only to those who are able to access government services, the recipients and the objects, who decides how the money will be spent? Who is the one making the decision? It's supposed to be government, it's supposed to be our representatives. That's why it's very important that you choose representatives who will protect, who will enhance, who will advance the interests and the rights of the very many who are paying and supporting and paying for their salaries. But many of all, of course, there are those who enter government to promote their own interests. And this is why Social Watch always says, Pera ng taambayan, the money of the citizen should go back to the citizens. Now, when you go back, you ask yourself. Maybe before you go to sleep, you ask yourself, what do you consume? How much do you spend today? What did you eat today? What are you wearing? What, what did you do? What gimmick did you do? What taxes are you paying? And how much are you getting from government? And you ask yourself who are getting much of the services of government. Okay, next. So why should citizens participate in public finance? First, it's because it is guaranteed in the Constitution. Second, because it is your money. And you have every right to ask questions. Because third, you are only entrusting your money to the government so that they will convert your money into services, into goods and services for the general public, for the production of public goods like education, like health, like health for the farmers, like bridges which lead to power and so on and so forth. We are only entrusting it to them and they are supposed to be bringing it here, giving it back, and they are accountable to the people. You have the key to make singing. I think the word is the same whether you are Visayan, you are Elong, or Cebuano, or you are Tagalog, you are Waray, it is singing. Singing is to demand accountability. Thanks. And why should you? You are all of you who are so much younger than I am. Why should you participate in public finance? And this is why I always tell my students, and some of them, occasionally, a few of them do listen, you should join government. Maskina SK, maskina barangay captain, maskina konsihal. You should join government because you know what government should be doing. You know what is the duty of a government official. Instead of just watching and making bagot bot, making criticisms and complaining, we should participate. Because government is what we make of it. No? And so, why should the youth participate? And remember what it shall say, how old was Emilio Jacinto when he joined the revolution? As the brains of the revolution. Oh, 19, just about your age. I'm not saying that you should go and shoot people, no? <laughs> but revolutions can happen in the mind, they can happen in society, they can happen in the soul, no? So, uh, because you are paying taxes. Second is because 
what government does with your money has implications for your future. If if government money is just wasted or goes down the drain, if government money is used to harm the environment, if government money is used to give you poor quality education, you don't deserve poor quality education. You don't deserve textbooks full of grammatical errors or full of wrong information and wrong data. You don't deserve teachers who themselves need further training. And third, because you are the future leaders. You don't even have to be the future leaders. You can be leaders right now. The minute you turn 18, you can already be a leader. And the best, the most important place to be involved in is in the money aspect. There are many things you can be involved in and all of them are important in women's rights, in poverty, in the environment. But all of these involve money and that is the most crucial of all. So 15 minutes na lang daw, okay. That's the trouble with Lola's. Lola's love to tell stories. Now, I will end with this, with this. What is the social development of the country? Yesterday, we were told, be proud, you have a 7% GDP growth. Feel Baninios a 7% GDP growth. See Baninios GDP growth. Okay. Now, let us look at the poverty numbers. This is a chart which which compares Marcos, Aquino, Ramos, Estrada, Arroyo, and the other Aquino. Now, the latest poverty numbers, Tulapa and third quarter, I still have to read about it. The latest is that 47% of Filipinos rate themselves as poor. This is practically one half. And I would bet you not a single one of you belongs to the 47%. You are at the 53%. The fact that you are here, the fact that you look the way you do, the fact that your complexions look the way your complexions do, the fact that the state of your health is the way it is, shows that you are not in the 47%. But are we the majority? No, we are not in the majority. Are we representative, even if we say that we are the leaders of the youth, we are not representative because there are many more of us who are not like us. Only a few months ago, I visited bringing computers. I visited a Muslim, Muslim-dominated school where most of the students were Muslims. And several schools where most of the students were IPs. You know, believe it or not, you have all the gadgets. I look at you, you're taking pictures of yourself all the time. My God, don't you get tired of taking pictures of yourself? <laughs> don't you get tired of counting the number of teeth you have, whether they're false or real? <laughs> or, or the size of your nostrils or the, the glitter in your eye? You're taking pictures of yourself. You're so obsessed with yourselves. But you know, do you know that there are elementary schools complete grade one to grade six without a single computer? Even the principal does not even have a computer. And I have visited in my age, only a few months ago, I have visited these schools. And you should see their eyes when they see a computer. They have never had a cell phone. They have never had an iPad. They have never had an iPhone. Just to, just to see how a computer works and not something which is printed on the manila paper and which is taught because they are required to be taught how a computer works. And there are schools, there are young people like you who are also dreaming. I don't know what they dream. And I have visited schools yesterday when I was listening to my 
I have visited schools where the teachers weep one school the teacher was weeping because the minute the children reach the girl children reach grade six and how old are they maybe 13 14 and they start having their periods they are married off and these kids cry because they want to finish grade six because they want to graduate from elementary but they have to be married off because sometimes marriage is considered a solution to poverty. Married perhaps to be the third or the fourth or the fifth wife of a very much older person. And this is happening right in your country. Right where you think you live in a country which you are proud of. This is why I'm saying you are not typical. And this is why I am shocked when you are so obsessed with your, the number of your teeth or the quality of your smile, or the way your eyebrows. You know, when you, I read, you watch Facebook, I, I get so amused and so delighted, and I love how somebody breaks her foot or not, be and tiil, grows up of the foot, how swollen it is. Somebody eats ice cream, the close up of the ice cream. And there are kids who are of your age who have never tasted. So don't you see how, how lucky you are? And you are taught to be sharing this with others. So 47% are poor, but government says, and refined numbers, 26%. Refined poverty, 21%. So they are 21%. That is not very much. Try thinking 96%. Million and 21% of that. That is nearly 20 million Filipinos. Okay, that's the level of poverty. Next. The degree of hunger in households. As of August 2012, and I'm not sure that even if it is Christmas, hunger has improved or has been mitigated because of what happened during the storm and the earthquake. 21%. Moderate hunger, occasional magutum potum is 80%. Severe hunger is 3%. Again, multiply your 96 million with 3%. That's 2.7 million, 3 million Filipinos. That's still a lot of souls. That's still a lot of young people. Still a lot of children. And by the way, how is hunger defined? Hunger is defined as involuntary hunger. Some of you here who are dieting because you are trying to lose weight, you are not included in those who are hungry. <laughs> because you are eating too much. <laughs> those who are counted as hungry are those who want to eat, who desperately want to eat who look at the basura you throw in the garbage can and want to eat them. Those are the ones who are counted as hungry. And those are the ones who are severely hungry. Don't you want to change the world? Just like that. Oh, you five minutes na <laughs> Unemployment. How many of you are looking forward to working once you finish. Of course, the lawyers want to work as lawyers. Yesterday, I was talking to Tochi, and he says he wants to be a judge like his mother. I'm looking at an engineering student, and of course, you want to practice engineering. The psychologists want to practice psychology. But then you have nurses who are working elsewhere. You have nurses who even work as dancers. Once I met a mechanical engineering graduate who was working as a caregiver. Okay. Now, what is the level of unemployment? <clears throat> For those who are unemployed, 50% of the unemployed are from the ages of 18 to 24. That's it. So once you graduate, there is no assurance that you will find a job. Just because you have the 7% GDP growth, you say, where is the GDP growth? Why I want to be employed because we have 7% GDP growth. Depends on what your course is. 
Depends on where you are located. Depends on what school. Have you not seen those ads? And I really hate those ads, even if I come from UP. They say that wanted so and so must be this high, this tall, and um, must be graduate of UP Ateneo and Lasal only. Or like here, I, I see wanted ads here in Maguete, must be graduates of Silliman University only. But Silliman has only 8,000 students. What do you do with the rest of the unemployed in the province, for example? So 50% of the unemployed are from the ages of 18 to 24. 31% are from the ages of 25 to 34. So you mga older, older, dyan, hindi ko nakagraduate or spending all their lives in studying, no? Mayroon ganun na hindi ko taking the time because university is such fun. Well, <laughs> well, that is what is waiting for you. But this is even much more interesting. This chart here, of the unemployed, how many percent are women? How many percent are girls or boys? Of the unemployed, 36.4% are women, are girls. What is the because? Why is it that there are more women unemployed? And when I discussed this with at least two senators, they gave me two different, they gave me some answers. So, Vanilla, you know, and the women will not like this kind of answer because this was an answer given to me by a macho senator. So, Vanilla, you know, our laws are very protective of women. So, our law says if you employ a woman, you must have offered room. You must be nice to her on certain days. You must have a clinic. If a woman has a child, whether married or not, you have to have health facilities. You have to give them time to feed their babies, etc. So if you are an employer and you are just after profit, if you have to choose between a man and a woman for the same job, who is more expensive to maintain, a woman employee or a man employee? And he said that's part of the reason. That, but of course, I don't like that. My explanation is that where is the biggest level of government expenditure right now? What's the biggest part of the budget is poured into, considering that this is election year, it is in infrastructure. So everywhere you go, I just came from Mindanao. It what used to take two hours from, from, from Cagayan de Oro to Iliga now takes three to four hours because the calzada is being kalkal, the roads are being dug up because you have to have new roads, you have to have new bridges, etc. And who are working on the roads and the bridges and the buildings? Of course it's the men who are digging the canals, who are uh, pouring the asphalt and the cement and the sand and the gravel. It's the men. So the jobs that are available tend to favor men more than women. And so sabi nila, sabi nila sa akin, ay naku Liling, what is your problem ba? So why don't you women learn how to climb buildings, how to pukpuk the martillo, and how to make cement, and how to drive all those big things, no? So, so time's up na. Okay. But then I'm 72 years old, no one can stop lawyers from me. Unemployment rate. Unemployment rate is 26 percent. So you're part of that. If you have, if you have the good fortune to have a nice body, so you practice body for the girls, so that you can dance and you can take off your clothes. Anyway, you're always taking off your clothes. <laughs> okay. Unemployment rate is 7.2 percent. That is still very high. 7.2% and the official number is that it is rising. It is rising. <coughs> next. Uh, next. Um, okay. For the, the famous 7%, uh, 
I have to end with the famous seven percent. Because we are told to go to church and to praise the Lord and to thank God because we have a seven percent GDP growth. Because we have the fastest growth in Asia. Now, as professionals or would be professionals, and this is my last message, I really have a lot of very uh, interesting data because that is my field. Okay. Now, uh, where is the growth coming from? Second quarter, agriculture and fishery, 0.7%. Industry, 0.46. Services, 7.6. The highest level of growth is in services. Agriculture is only 4%. Where are the poor? Where are most of the Filipino people? And where are all your poor relatives? Who are not in school, they're in agriculture. That is where the lowest rate growth is. The second place where you sector, see you have to ask, where is the growth concentrated? The growth is concentrated in services. Swear to you. Because for two days I've been listening to you. How nice you speak your English. How nice your grammar. How nice your pronunciation. You will all qualify in BPO. So be prepared to stay up to 8 o'clock. <laughs> 12 hours. <laughs> but by the way, there has been a rise in HIV AIDS. And where is the sec what is the sector contributing greatly? It's also the BPO sector. Because it involves a change of lifestyle. It involves a change in culture. Anyway, what I'm saying, so I look at the 7%. Where is it coming from? I would like to repeat it. The 7%, the highest level of growth is in services. So all of you, Better retain your very nice speaking voice and your grammar, and anyway, you are used to staying up late. So, uh, but not all of you can be taken, can be absorbed in BPO. The second area which should be a good source of jobs is industry. Industry cannot catch up with BPO. Agriculture is the lowest. And where is in the expenditure side? Because you are taught in economics, look at the expenditure side of the gross domestic product. The biggest side is consumer spending. All of you are spending. Because most of the Filipinos are young and they are still in the spending stage. And most of you, where do you get your spending? Mainly from abroad. Mainly from, from overseas remittances. The next biggest side of expenditure is government expenditure. Why is there increase in government expenditure? It is because next year is an election year. So all the roads are being dug up. You know how much it costs? Services, you know why GDP is so big in services. For a 30 minute advertisement in TV, that's 300,000 at this time. By next year, it will be much higher. For 30 seconds. So better to learn how to advertise, to dance, and to sing. And anyway, you already dance and you sing. So you'll be crowding in services. But you cannot all be absorbed in services. So you might end up in nightclubs. <laughs> Where there are boys or girls. And so, the lesson that I would like to leave with you is while figures do not fly. This is what was taught to me when I was a 15-year-old senior in the College of Business Administration. Figures do not lie, but liars figure. <laughs> so take a second look that is part of your discipline. If you are given a number, see where it is coming from. If you are talking about public finance, ask who is giving the money, who is bearing the burden. If you are talking about services, you ask who are receiving the services. If you are talking about decisions about money, you ask who are making decisions. And you better be part of the decision. And that is my challenge to you. Participate in public finance. 
participate in all the things that concern us as a society. Because as for me, I'm going already very near, I'm already nearing the pre-departure area. <laughs> but in your case, you are still checking in. Thank you. <laughs> So, maayong uh, aga sa tanan, maayong udo sa tanan, uh, ma'am, uh, good, uh, good, good noon. Uh, I'm Eric Martinanan from uh, President of the United Sula Guilty of Progress in the province of Sultan Kudara. And I'm with the Sanguniang Kabataan Municipal Federation of Sula Sultan Kudara also. Uh, I have this question since we are on the public finance. Kanina po, it was presented by uh, one of our guest uh, speaker or one of our lecturers that the budget is divided among the provinces, uh, provinces within, in the entire Philippines. So, napansin po namin that marami pong malalaking bilog doon, ibig sabihin malalaki din po yung budget. Then, na, natuon po yung pansin namin doon sa mga provinces in Mindanao, we're in, hindi naman po lingit sa kalaman natin na sa Mindanao po maraming deprived areas na merong conflict because of war. I know, alam niyo po yan. So, napansin po namin kanina na bakit po ito sa mga areas na yun na nangangailangan po ng mga basic social services like equal access to education and health services po, bakit po maliliit yung pondo inililaan ng gobyerno? Kumpara doon sa mga cities na uh, andyan na po marami na po pwedeng tumulong. Um, I have... I I'm glad. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I was going to show you this chart. Out of the total budget for 2013, Mindanao is allotted 26% of the budget. Visayas, and many of you are from the Visayas, is allotted 24% of the budget. And the zone Luzon is 20% pala ang sa Visayas. Luzon is allotted 54% of the budget. And that tells you the story. That is your answer. The bigger part of the total budget, the biggest part, 54% goes to Luzon. And this is not my number. This is from the DBM. And 20, 26% to Mindanao, Visayas is 20%. Now, I, I am from the Visayas, but Luzon at Mindanao, I think it's perhaps one of the most beautiful, it's the biggest, the most diverse island, and the most beautiful people in the face of the Philippines. And I'm, I'm talking about Mindanao. Why is it that we don't notice Mindanao? Yesterday morning, I was watching television. Somebody was saying, uh, well, if you talk the vowel, you always, you immediately you remember Suha, you remember Lanzones, you remember Dorian. So you think of an island which is full of food. But uh, Michelle, give me the next numbers on, on, on hunger. Where is the highest incidence of hunger as of August? Social weather station. The highest incidence of hunger is in Mindanao. And none of you here thinks of Mindanao as hungry because you think Mindanao bananas, suha, you think Mindanao uh, palawan and so on and so forth. Lots of food, you think banana plantations. This is the number before Pablo. So you have a situation where your budget is out of sync. If the purpose of a budget, because a public budget is supposed to respond to public need. The budget is supposed to reduce hunger, inequality, and reduce unemployment, etc. Then it is applied elsewhere. Because where is the hunger? The hunger is in Mindanao. And I'm sure it's more than 30% right now. What is the poverty? The poverty is in the Visayas, 63%. But not the Visayas here, in this hall. They're not part of the poor. They are the ones who are left behind. But what does the UNDP say? And, and then uh, Rafilo is here. She is representing the UNDP. UNDP says, development, if you want to be proud of your 7%, no one should be left behind. 
the, the, the motto here is no one should be left behind. It should not only be a, those in services getting 7% when agriculture gets 4%. No one should be left behind. Right now, Mindanao is left behind. Right now, Visayas is left behind. Something has to be done about the budget. It has to be reworked and fast because Pablo has exacerbated. I like the word exacerbated. It's very long, it's difficult to spell, but look it up and you will know what it means. Hunger is exacerbated, poverty is exacerbated by Pablo. Look it up. So you have your answer. Thank you.